Can you hear me okay? Yep. All done. Yes. All done. How's the connection? I'm trying to fix this phone. If I go like this, it turns off. Ah. <laughs> hold on. Okay, I'll I hold can my hear phone you and I can hand. see you, which is a great start. Okay, okay. Hello. I'm in my office though, so. Oh, that's great. No, that's perfect. I'm at home. We're in lockdown here in Sydney, so mm -hmm. unfortunately I'll have to do it from end. What time is it over there right now? It's exactly 12, 12, yeah, p.m. 12, 12 p.m. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. It's been a while since I've seen you and um, I'm really honored to have you on today. I think a lot of our viewers are going to find this really meaningful and really special. Mm -hmm. um, we've just passed a very special anniversary that to this day, more and more people are finding out about Srebrenica because to most of our surprise, not everyone is aware of what actually happened in 1995. So we're hoping that today you can tell us as a survivor of the March of Death and the mm -hmm. current president of the municipality mm -hmm. um, of Srebrenica, your story. So um, would you be ready for the first questions that I have? Yeah, before? sure. I, I, I'm ready. <laughs> Great. So how we, how we are going to do this is I'll have my questions come through first. Um, mm -hmm. And then I will read out some of the questions that we had come through before um, we announced, before this interview started. So as mm -hmm. I announced it, we had people send in questions and then mm -hmm. someone may have a question for you as we go. So they might be messaging us through the all Instagram right. live. Okay. So okay. first of all, tell us about who you are and tell us about your story as a survivor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, Esma, for uh, being interested in, in spreading the truth. And thank you, everyone who, who is in, in this uh, room, live Instagram room. Uh, hello to everybody. Everybody, I'm, I'm Chamil Durankovic, as I was introduced. Uh, I am 42 years old. Currently, I'm in a position of the uh, president of Municipal Assembly, and I'm better known for being a mayor uh, for eight years of this uh, small town of eastern Bosnia called Srebrenica that is well known throughout the world for unfortunately or tragic past in 1995. Yeah, at that time, uh, as my age tells, I was 16. I was uh, pretty not old enough to understand everything that was happening, but also not young as much not to remember anything. So I do have my uh, memory and, and I still uh, can uh, tell my story, which is one of the many stories of the people for, from Srebrenica and actually people from the region of eastern part of Bosnia called Podrinje, because not only people from Srebrenica were here at the time of genocide. So people from, uh, let's say, uh, minimum like five to ten uh, towns surrounding Srebrenica, like Lasenica, Zvornik, Vjeljina, Višegrad, Foča, Rogatica. These are all, all towns in, in eastern Bosnia. So all the people actually found their... They were... In Srebrenica, they found their refuge. I mean, they, they, they saved their lives by running from the Serb, Serb forces and they uh, settled here in, in Srebrenica. So around... 55,000 people were living at the moment in this small town, which was uh, not only not, not the municipality uh, territory, but the small downtown, maybe close to 150 square kilometers. And this small downtown between the hills, and you've been here, you know how small <laughs> Srebrenica is, uh, yes. like 55,000 people is, is like crowdy. It's like uh, day and night you could see people on the streets living in, in un, uh, like inhuman uh, conditions like uh, on the streets, uh, in improvised houses and, and all this. Uh, it actually to me it looked like a big uh, concentration camp uh, because we were surrounded by Serb forces all, all around the hills of Srebrenica and, and life in, in the enclave, how we call it, uh, was like just in like in concentration camp. So yeah, uh, we uh, in 1992 
uh, when war broke out, uh, my parents, uh, my father and my mother, are born in this uh, uh, town, uh, small village called Luka, which is the farthest uh, village in this municipality. It's 52 kilometers from downtown. So at the beginning, nobody believed that actually war would bring uh, all this uh, killings and all uh, this time, actually, that war was uh, going on, like for a few years. Everybody at the beginning thought that war will be just a few days and, and that we could run uh, from downtown, hide in this uh, village, Luka, and then come back a few days after. Nobody believed, even my parents and elderly, they didn't believe that war is possible in, in our mm. beautiful country, Bosnia. No, nobody was uh, actually sure what was going to happen. Yeah, yes. and uh, in April of 1992, uh, uh, Two of my brothers and my parents. There's, I have two brothers, uh, and and uh, five of us actually went to this uh, village uh, called Luka, and and we spent there a few few months uh, because uh, we were waiting for to see what the destiny of of the town will be and and how the war would uh, be. And a few few months after that, actually Srebrenica was. Uh, uh, taken over by Bosnian army, let's say. First, the Serbs forces came in and they uh, uh, killed first innocent civilians in downtown. They burned the houses, they destroyed and they uh, robbed uh, all the, the houses uh, here. And then a few, two months after that, our forces took it over from Serbs. So it was May 1992 when we all returned yeah. to, to, to Srebrenica again. I, I'm sorry, I have to give the the no, picture it's the of, full of, picture from of, the very, yeah, very Just for, for the exactly. audience that, that is not yeah. Bosnian to understand how, how things uh, were uh, going course. on. Of so course. in May of 1992, we came back from Luka to Srebrenica and we continued our life in this uh, downtown. And then, yeah, that year from 1992 to 1993 in April was one of the worst times in my life because the hunger was... Uh, uh, there was a hunger, there, there was sh grenades and sh shootings and, and all this. Like it, the, life in war is like every day somebody is killed and, and all, every day you hear the, the, the shotguns and rifles and all this uh, the shelling or grenades or bombs, whatever. Uh, so that life was like hiding every day until we got to the point of 1993 when Srebrenica was UN protected zone. And this is what is important from now on, where yes. international community jumps in, because we were this uh, downtown that was surrounded from 1992 to 1993. And, and all these numbers of people that were living here were in danger to be actually killed. So that's when the United Nations stepped in. Uh, they uh, came here and they, um, by the resolution of United Nations in April 1993, Srebrenica was pronounced. Uh, I think, have we lost connection here for a sec? Let's I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry, just I, as I, you were saying, the most crucial, crucial component of the whole story. We, well, just... when I mentioned the international community, they cut us off. I'm, <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's um, okay. Well, we're gone. I, I filled everyone in. So the UN actually declared Srebrenica as a yeah. safety zone, which means what for the Bosnian? That means that, the, that the, actually war had stopped for us. That our army was de demilitarized. So that means mm -hmm. that they had to... Uh, give their weapons to the United Nations troops. So we had no army. Uh, and that's how we mm -hmm. became protected by the UN forces that came in. So the first mm -hmm. battalion that came to Srebrenica was Canadian battalion of uh, maybe a few hundred soldiers. They came in and they were the ones that were protecting people of Srebrenica. And so, so in that time, we believe that war is over for us, that... Uh, Peace okay. had come and there's no shootings anymore. And then, like, somehow life started to normalize. We even had a school started. And so that's the point where, where I uh, started my uh, 
uh, eighth grade. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my eighth grade. Yeah, and then I uh, went to uh, high school after after that. So uh, my parents, because of the hunger that was uh, at that time, like here, they, they went back to Luca, to the place from the beginning of my story, actually to provide, to plan uh, the, the food, uh, like uh, to have a food, to, to survive. So they went there again with my middle brother and I stayed in downtown with my grandmother actually to continue the school. Oh. Uh, and that's how I uh, lived. Uh, I lived by myself actually with my grandmother until July 1995. And that's, that's, that time was uh, for me to decide what to do when, when, when everything started in, in July 1995 was the biggest decision of my life. I had two choices. One was to surrender down in Potocari as other civilians and another one was to go through the mountains in the death march that actually I decided to go because I was kind of bigger uh, uh, physically bigger than, than my uh, my age uh, generation so I, I decided not to surrender down in Potocari I decided to go through the mountains with other close to 14,000 men mostly wow. and some some women uh, too so I decided to go through the mountains and, and that seven day uh, journey is also hell of my uh, life. It's, uh, you know, you were 16 years old, you, you were been never facing directly such uh, terror or uh, killings of people, ambushes and shellings that we had all, all, all days, all seven days that I walked through Tuzla was like every day somebody close to me was was shot actually i started with my uh, i started my journey through uh, mountains with my uncle and two of his sons we were one small group so we were first day we were uh, together and the first ambush that we had actually separated us and i've never seen them since all three of them actually were killed and i was lucky to to uh, to survive so those seven days for me were uh, even worse than all years spent in Srebrenica from 1992 to 1995. So if you can imagine all, all, all the terror that I've seen, like 1992 and 1993, 1994 and 1995 are not as great as, as seven days of my walk through the death march and seeing all, all these uh, scenes. Uh, in, and, and, and that's something that still haunts me like, Are there any scenes in particular? I mean, I've... Actually, the first one was... Uh, it, somehow it's a message how each individual is trying to, to survive in, in, in uh, risky situations. Like this place called Kamen, it's, uh, it's the first place where we had the column of 14,000 uh, of us uh, had the ambush from Serb forces. Uh, that scene is still uh, hunts me today. It's like when the shooting started to uh, the group of us, we were at one hill uh, resting to continue the, the, the trip. And then the shooting started directly in the, in the people. In the, you, you could hear the, the bullets hitting the bodies of, of the people around you. So we, we were laying down in order to hide. And there was a man with the red sweater uh, I, I remember that like I'm looking at, at it right now. Like he was laying down and I was hiding my, because you always run to hide your head when it's shooting. Like you, you, don't, you don't care about your body if it hits the leg or arm or anything, but you're just trying to hide your head. That's the instantly reaction, instant reaction from, from people that are trying to save their lives. So I was hiding below his belly and he was hiding below my body. So. He, he was hiding his head under me. I was hiding my head under him. So it was kind of survival of the fittest. And it, at, in one moment, this man was just, his body shook, like, and I could tell that he, he was hit and he was killed. So it was shooting for like, let's say five to 10 minutes. It was constant uh, shooting. And, and then when it stopped, I could tell that this man is dead. So I stand up and I continue walking looking at, at people who survived around me and something was like hitting me in the neck. As I walked, there was something 
like I could see that it's right. sharp and it's touching my neck. So I was, I, I thought it's, it's maybe a grass or, or maybe a wood, piece of wood that actually uh, um, hit me here and, and, and stuck uh, behind my neck. And so I took it and I could see that the arm of this man was cut like in the middle of, of, of the biceps. And it was actually stuck to my backpack and my neck. So I took it and I threw it on the, on the ground. And, and that man actually saved my life because he was killed on me. If there was no his body, actually I would be a dead, dead person today. So that's something that I remember the most. And there were other situations like, but this is the most, uh, uh, for me, most, uh, let's say, shocking one. And for those of you who may not know, there is a book that Chamuel is writing and he details a lot of these scenes in that book, which I've been fortunate enough to have started reading. And there are some, what I couldn't understand is your position of fear and panic. I mean, the way that I was reading these stories is you're 16 years old. You are running for your life. You're seeing horror and terror all around you. You're in such a state of fight or flight. To have survived such a thing is an absolute miracle and to come to where you are today is so admirable that you took that horror and turned that trauma into a proactive initiative to do something very important which will bring us to our next questions but so you've told us about your story as a survivor you've told us what memory has stuck with you the most which was also one of my questions so can you tell us about how the families today having experienced very similar are coping and what's the situation in bosnia at the moment with the trauma and the people yeah, well, actually, uh, from 1995, when we all uh, got together again, my mother came with the civilians and I came through the mountains and my oldest uh, brother was wounded uh, in 1993 and he was transferred by the UN helicopters as heavily wounded soldier to Tuzla to be treated. So we, uh, my mother, brother and I, we connected in Tuzla in, in July 1995 all mm -hmm. safe alive uh, and my uh, father and my middle brother were actually captured by the serb forces in in this place called uh, uh Zepa or luka where where they were at the moment uh, and they were they were kept at the concentration camp in serbia called mitrovo polje and Shrivovica. Mm -hmm. so as pow's or prisoners of war they were transferred by the red cross to united states so that's when they sent us a visa And we seem to have had a pause on him again. Sorry, everyone. I think we've lost him momentarily. So it's really important. I'm, Hello, Beck? People are calling me on my phone. So this is what happens oh. here. And it That's cuts okay, while out. you're away, I just fill in. It's fine. Yeah, it's a, it's fine. I'm, I'm going sure. yeah, on my phone. And when they call, it somehow blocks. So we, we all, uh, I, I hope that, that uh, we can just can continue. And uh, so we That's all connected uh, in the United States. In 1996, we all of us, all five of us, actually my uh, two of my brothers, my parents, we connected there. So I lived there for actually... 10 years. I uh, mm -hmm. finished my high school there and my uh, university. So in 2005, I decided to come back to Bosnia, actually to Srebrenica and somehow invest my education experience and everything uh, to uh, reforms of this country that needs a lot of push up to get to, uh, let's say, family of European countries as we call it European Union and all these integrations after war. And, and I just decided mm -hmm. that I would be more useful here than, than in the States. So that was my quick decision to come back after I graduated. And, and yeah, I, I, I got busy here, really. It's, my life is, yeah, I'm yeah. trying to, to, to be uh, productive somehow. And these days I am in politics, but as independent candidate, I'm not a member of any political party. I'm trying to have this uh, personal policy for Srebrenica, for people that return here after everything and they're fighting to re, 
uh, uh, somehow rebuild their life and, and, and continue their lives after everything. But we do go through a lot of uh, uh, sy systematic obstructions and political obstructions. And uh, mm -hmm. this part of the country is called Republic of Srpska now. And, and it tells you that it's exclusivity of, of one, one people and politics in 90s actually committed genocide. So they didn't want us to ever return here and live. But we do somehow. Uh, uh, we do and we manage to sustain and live. It's not as it used to be, but yeah, it, it, yeah, we, we, we do have a reason for being here. Of course. And as I was watching some documentaries on Srebrenica very recently, what I did during the anniversary was I shared a lot of information about how we could almost say that the pleas were ignored at the time when Srebrenica was on high alert when everyone was pleading, when the media in Bosnia were asking for intervention, would you say that there was a little bit of an ignoration towards help that could have been achieved at the time? And why is this relevant today? Uh, well, I think that the international community, they even admitted for failing to protect Srebrenica and, and its people in 1995. And yeah, they said sorry, they regret, they, and, 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 and they say that... Uh, uh, Severance should never happen again to anybody. But what we have today is uh, the same international community is ignoring the fact that those politics that committed genocide are still existing. They inherit mm -hmm. just in peacetime. They don't kill and shoot, but they politically do everything to deny genocide, to actually... Uh, glorify the war criminals that, that, that actually are, uh, let's say, Karadzic, Mladic, and all those people that actually are uh, war criminals in prison now for genocide and everything. They are heroes for this uh, politics and, and people uh, that support those politics. So an international community, even the international courts, the ones that actually passed out decisions on genocide. They proved genocide. Genocide is not our political view. It's proved by international courts. It's a crime against uh, humanity that is actually proven in the courts, not in the politics. So, and mm -hmm. still we have this denial of this part, in this part of the country, especially called entity of Republic of Srpska, the institutions and politicians are still denying and still 26 years after we live under the denial of for what happened to us in 1995. So that's what hurts the most after everything and after international community regretted what happened here, they still let local politicians deny genocide and glorify the war criminals. How can so they that is deny genocide despite, there is footage available on YouTube. There is documented stories and proofs and evidences. And as you said, in court, the denial of this genocide, how is that actually being achieved? And what threat does that pose for Bosnia today? Well, the, the threat is like history repeats. When somebody realizes that uh, you can commit genocide and not be punished for that, then probably mm -hmm. you use that as a, as a mechanism to gain the territory, to like, you, you just... Uh, proclaim your uh, ultra-nationalistic ide uh, ideologies and, and et cetera, et cetera. So if that is not banished, it is for sure is going to repeat. So that is a danger, not only for us. We live through that and we know what we can expect. But this is happening in the middle of Europe and it's a threat for a future uh, uh, Srebrenica's to happen. So that's what we are afraid of. And our fight is actually a prevention of future Srebrenica cases. So that's what we do. And, and what I'm, like, as a surviving victim of genocide, what I am uh, mad the most is like actually this ignorance from it's the same international community mm -hmm. that ignored the facts in, in July 1995. And that yes. needs to change. That, that, we have no prosperity and future if that doesn't change. It's a minimum of, uh, uh, let's call, it, call them civilized norms in democratic societies. Here, 
we have we still have politics that deny genocide that is unacceptable like it's just like if you compare nazistic germany and and world war second let's let's imagine that you still have nazistic party existing and the third right existing and gestapo police existing and 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 somebody is glorifying that it's unacceptable so what we have here is like as the s party exists then you have police that is identified as as responsible for genocide and we have this entity called republic of serbska still exists so that is the absurd of 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 human history ever that you you if you commit genocide you get uh yeah you get away. You, yeah you get away with that and 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 all this politic politics exists so yeah somebody is mentioning palestine china myanmar yeah they are all the lessons to us that that uh, what what can happen in the world so that's why we need to fight to prevent uh, such uh, cases so by what means it, let's say to deny genocide vocally they come out they say we deny the genocide happened on what grounds can they say that what is their backing they support they don't they don't uh, what they say is like they do not accept decisions of uh, the Hague tribunal the international court that actually passes out decisions on on war crim- crimes and they don't accept the decisions of those courts they say it didn't happen and what they try to do is to re- relativize or 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 to equalize like they they say like they killed us we killed them and blah 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 like so what we cannot accept is like each crime war crime has its victims and perpetrators they have their names and last names so we uh are surviving victims of genocide genocide is proved in the courts we are speaking about a war crime committed against us we do not ignore the facts that on each side in the war people innocent people were killed but each crime should have its dimension its punishment yeah exactly. it's all on dimension so, so what yes. what they trying to do is to equalize all crimes and call it civil war and like yeah they killed us we killed them and that's it they're trying to approve genocide to be as a response to other other crimes so it's unacceptable so the worst the crime committed in the previous war it was genocide in Srebrenica uh crimes against humanity in Prijedor that happened uh and Prijedor we had uh, this uh, commemoration in Prijedor yesterday and such crimes are like thousands of people were killed in one place in in few days so you cannot compare that to anything else not only yeah. killed but as you were saying they were they were tortured they were victimized they were yep, yep. it was so, children and the very very young kids that were victims to this over 8000 people and yep. they they still deny despite the footage despite the ruling in international courts and this is very interesting to me because it brings us now to the questions that a lot of my friends and instagram followers when they were watching the education that i put on instagram about srebrenica they wanted to know how can we as an international community so not just the bosnians who understand and know it like i think no one else ever will and people like yourself but how can we collectively help you this is a direct question <clears throat> to to um towards the acceptance of the genocide what can actually be done so well we uh, accept it at least as international community should uh, encourage their governments not to accept any kind of relationship with those countries that officially deny genocide in bosnia so it's mm-hmm. simple like uh, on july 11 we had this uh, video speech of a uh, uh, eu commissioner uh he said that there's no place for countries that deny genocide in european family so uh but while uh, besides that they they are in in negotiations with serbia for example they encourage serbia to join european union but on this side to us they say there's no place for countries that deny genocide then why do you negotiate why do you encourage them why don't you just have your position and say no before you accept international uh decision, court decisions we will not negotiate with you on your 
way to, to European Union or any other uh, relationship, diplomatic and all others. So I think in that matter, if all countries stood on one side of civilized world against few that deny, uh, sooner or later they would have to accept the facts of, of uh, uh, unbeatable evidence. I mean, it's, you cannot so can go community, against that. What can us as the everyday person or someone on Instagram or an influencer, someone was asking, does it matter if social influencers collectively talk about it? or anyone that has definitely. a social well, presence, what can we do? Definitely, spreading the truth, spreading the, the today's truth, what we live in. As I told you, we still, 26 years after, live in the times where genocide is officially denied by politicians in this country, by certain politicians in this country. So if we spread the truth more and more to more countries all over the world, like maybe, yeah, Srebrenica is well known, but we still need to spread that truth uh, for more people to hear. Someday, maybe some of your children will become officials of the, of the countries. So they just need to know the truth and uh, not more, not less than what it is. So spread it more. Just talk about that and never let deniers convince you that they're right and that the victims are wrong. So that, 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 that shouldn't happen. So we know what happened here and it's the only truth that we have. So just spread it. Keep spreading and educating. Someone has asked, has the Bosniak population living in Srebrenica increased or decreased in the last five years? Unfortunately, uh, the population of this town before the war was close to 37,000. During the war, we had 55,000, as I told you, for the people that ex find their refuge here. And uh, now we have from five to 7,000 people living here. Unfortunately, due to this demographic collapse, all, all the killings, all biological loss, uh, we have around 5,000 5, people living. Uh, half of that are Bosniaks and half of that are, are Serbs. Uh, that number didn't change since the beginning of return that started in mm. 2000 so until now it's it's around that number few people go few people come back but that's about that number it didn't change much it didn't change much so someone has also asked for the many people who have migrated to australia or other countries survival has played a big part in their family story such as mm -hmm. my own family mm -hmm. and for some people they can experience a sense of guilt or shame so how does someone like you reconcile as a survivor this narrative? So what happens to the people that come back from overseas? And what has your experience been with those who weren't there during the war, who had survived? Is there any form of survivor's guilt? And well, it depends. I, I think that people are not problem here. All people, like all ethnic groups. It's politics that... that keep this pressure on people. So the, the easiest way to win elections is to, to use this so-called national primitivism rhetorics. So it's easiest way after the war to get people to support you if you say, I will protect you from those. So uh, people are not mm. the problem. We live in Srebrenica, they, there was no single case of revenge. Like people live together. But I, as I told you, politics are problem. People are not mm. People are not the problem. They get along uh, with each other. Actually, people e didn't start the wars here in the Balkans. Politics started the wars. Politics. And they, they dragged in their own people into, into the war. So uh, they abused or they manipulated people to actually kill each other. So I, I don't see a problem with this reconciliation. I have many friends uh, from Serbs uh, ethnic groups especially those that are clear about the past, that they didn't do anything during the war, that they didn't, uh, let's say, uh, uh, kill or that they're not responsible for war crimes and etc. All other people are, okay, we live together, we get along and we try to build a better future for our children. So it's, it's not much of a problem uh, if you have a will and you intend to actually uh, build a better future. We are, unfortunately, yeah, we cannot change our past, but definitely learn from the past. We can make a better future. So everybody here, when, when you talk about people, are determined.
here. So I hope so. I hope so too. And the last question from our viewers that sent in a message was, what can organizations and governments do to help the people now? See, besides uh, our biological loss, we lost uh, many people and it's hard to rebuild the life after that. But besides biological loss, we also had the infrastructure loss. Like let's say, for example, 6,600 houses, single family houses, at least need a minimum of, of human conditions, living conditions. So mm -hmm. we still are waiting to rebuild a little bit over 4,000 houses, even 26 wow. years after. Per year, we rebuilt close to like 10 to 15 houses. That, is, that means like in 200 years, we wouldn't even rebuild the houses. Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about roads, electricity, and all this other uh, needs to people. So, so any kind of help, financial or any other, educational or anything could help rebuild a life. So we are starting from ground zero. So imagine now if somebody is starting from ground zero, what's needed, everything is needed. So uh, any kind of help to, to the families, to the children, like uh, it, it's, it, it's needed. So in, if you ask me what's needed, everything is needed. It's simple. It's life is on, on, on some zero ground. Uh, so we are trying to rebuild it. Well, but if the you state, could send me, yes, continue, sorry. But the state should be more responsible for, mm. uh, for the return and returnees and people. It's, uh, there are different speculations in, in the public about Srebrenica, a lot of money was invested, blah, blah, blah. But uh, if you come here and you take a look, you could tell that people that are living here didn't get much Maybe somebody misused, abused, whatever. But here, if you come to downtown and you see the houses, you go uh, on the villages, you check how people live in what conditions, then you would see that's much more needed to bring that con life conditions to, to a higher level of normal, let's say. Okay. And you can maybe send me through if there are any particular families or organizations that I take will. donations or whatever we can do here from Australia. Please do let me know and I can share. I will. With I will. We'll be in touch, definitely. Yes, definitely. And also, just tell us um, at the moment. So we know that there is genocide denial happening. What are the next steps? What are you planning to do? What can we do as the everyday person? To... We, what we are trying to to do here is to encourage international community, especially OHR, which still mm -hmm. which still runs the country by the Dayton's Peace Agreement. We we're trying to encourage them and pressure our politicians to adopt the law about against denial. So that's what we need. That's the first thing we need in order to continue uh, 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 in normal conditions. So at least that we can charge those that deny. At this moment, they deny and they glorify and we cannot do anything about that. So we need to fight for that state law that, de that, that will punish those that deny genocide. Yes, and is that looking do you think to happen in the near future? Is that going I, to be a long I, I process? Think, I think sooner or later, even or parliament will adopt it or uh, OHR would enforce it. We'll see what happens, but I'm pretty confident that it will have to happen. Great, that's, that's really good to hear. So then do you have, if you could send one last message to everyone that's joined us today um, or tonight, what would that be? Well, uh, it's about that we cannot change our past, but we have to learn from the past and do everything to fix the mistakes from the past and try to build a better future, more peaceful world. I'm sounding like a Miss World now. No. <laughs> yeah, peace, That's peace in the bad. world. But, but I, I am actually, I'm actually just, I committed my life for, to fight for uh, norms of civilization, civilized norms of democratic society and just, to build peace everywhere, no wars. I just, I, I would commit my life for that. Not only in Bosnia, but all over the world, we see many tragic scenes and, and all over. Just fight against violence. Yes. Wars should stop. We are, Well, definitely. Know. And it begins with the recognition that it's wrong, that, that there was genocide. If you can't even admit towards one of what was worse, the worst war, worst 
sorry, genocide since the Holocaust. If people can't own up and admit to that, then what kind of future are we facing in regards to what can happen to Bosnia? It's very, it's very alarming and very scary. So it's good to know that through education and advocacy, we can actually... Sorry, I'm sorry. Your... No, uh... that's okay. I'm sure that we won't be able to keep you too much longer, but we do have one question that came through regarding the rebuilding that you were speaking about. So for the houses, is the, is the issue money or the processes at the moment when it comes it's, to that? It, it's processes. I guess that uh, it's, it's not the money. I think we still need as a society, as all ethnic groups here, we still need to, uh, we need to get to the point of change of generations of new newer generations that actually get more education and more modern than, than the previous generations. We need to switch that uh, uh, generation change in order to bring new ideas to uh, modern democratic uh, societies and modern countries. Uh, we need more, more younger people getting into the processes. I think it will come. Some things will be healed by the time. So we just need to go through that. And I, I am pretty confident that one day we will get there. I definitely think so. And it's important, as you said, for the youth to be aware and very proactive in this process too. If we educate the youth about what's going on and recognizing the steps towards what can lead to such horror and conflict, then those people who eventually do come into power will refuse to allow these things to happen and know exactly how to recognize it. I had a question from a friend. Uh, she says, can we vote for you from Australia? Oh, why not? I mean, uh, see, everybody <laughs> can, can actually be part of the process, including our diaspora, especially people from Bosnia that are living all over the world and they are successful. And for example, like you, you are a successful young lady from Bosnia and, and you did uh, tremendous things in Australia. You even became a Miss uh, Australia. That, that's something that you can be ambassador of the values of your native country, Bosnia. And so, and I see you do it. And that's why I'm proud of you, that, that you mm -hmm. didn't, uh, uh, didn't turn you back to your native country and, and you still fight to spread the truth and tell uh, to more people. I, I'm pretty sure that you have uh, this uh, web of, of many friends and people of, of uh, organization and et cetera. So just, just promote your country. It's enough to tell the truth to show the beautiful places of this country, to tell a little bit about the past, and, but also to promote the uh, beautiness of this country. And I think there's many to promote. And that's how we can uh, get the world to know more of Bosnia and more about our history, more about our, uh, let's say, wealth of nature and, and everything that we have. So I think, yeah, just be Bosnians. <laughs> and and that, that, that is the best way to promote. Uh, well, I'll country. definitely want to come back to the country as soon as the restrictions are over and we can travel again. I think, you know, okay. it'd be wonderful to come back. I'm just scrolling through to see if anyone else has any questions they want to ask while we still have you. But it's honestly been such an honor to have your time and to shed light on the issue and what's going on today. But it seems hopeful. It seems like it's heading in a positive direction. I found that this year, for some reason, with the anniversary, there was even more happening around the message and the education. I know myself, I learned more than I ever have and I've shared more than I ever have. I know we have a documentary coming out. I think it's an international film, um, Where Are You Going, Ada, which encompasses mm -hmm. and captures some of the stories. So hopefully with more attention on Srebrenica and the genocide, you know, they will start to make those changes happen a little bit more forcefully. And I'm just thinking to myself even now about writing to these, officials and, and asking them what's going on in terms of letting, you know, and negotiating these um, processes if they still haven't admitted to the crimes that have mm. been committed. I mean, the only way you can really take a stand against it is to not enable it. So exactly. I suppose right. we also have to talk about their role and their responsibility that they have within this picture. Because when mm. you enable these things, then what reason is there to admit something if there's no consequence to do so. So it's good to know that we know what we can be doing moving forward. Okay, we'll continue our fight together. That's well, great. I will be running now. 
It's been sure my hour. <laughs> Offer to you. Perfect. So I hope, yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us and all pozdrav the best. Pozdrav do Sabita iz Trčina. <laughs> Mnogo pozdrav. Have, have a beautiful day and uh, we will talk soon. Thanks again for joining us. Okay, thank you for calling us, ma'am. That's okay. Yeah. Speak soon. Yeah, bye-bye. Alayh man. Ciao. Alayh man.